You're welcome. The Boston Spin in May. Uh, a little bit about Boston Spin. How many people are here for the first time? Wow, a lot. Excellent. Excellent. Welcome. Um, this is our 19th year. We're a nonprofit. We have meetings every month, usually on the third Tuesday of the month, unless there's a holiday. Um, we are free. There's no membership dues, no fees, no paying for food, nothing. Um, we have over 1,200 members currently, and we're averaging around 60 plus members per meeting. Uh, we're all run by volunteers. Uh, so everybody you see up here doing anything is completely volunteer. Um, we offer interesting, relevant meetings, roundtables, networking discussions. Uh, there's a free online job board. If you're looking for uh, a job or you're looking for someone uh, for your company, it's free to post there and free to, uh, to peruse it. Um, no advertising, no sales uh, of any kind uh, at the meetings or using your email addresses or anything like that. Uh, we offer good snacks, good conversation, and hopefully, uh, hopefully fun. There are 40 U.S. spins uh, all over the U.S., and uh, often uh, we get uh, solicitations from other spins. If you're traveling to Philadelphia, Los Angeles, wherever, there, there are spins out there as well, and they certainly uh, welcome people from the Boston spin. Uh, internationally, there are over 78 international spins. So if you're traveling internationally, you can visit a spin uh, probably where you are at that location as well. And if you want to find out about the spins, you can go to the SCI website uh, the, uh, at CMU. These are some of our volunteers. Uh, we have, uh, no, I should be putting this in the slide, shouldn't I? So much there we go. Um, I knew I was missing the bouncing green ball. So anyone you see with a green dot on their name tag uh, is a volunteer. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can come talk to us. Um, I'm Barry Mirror, the chair. Carol, Kamita, Jim, Maria, Paul, uh, all elected officers. Uh, we have a number of appointed officers as well to work on programs, uh, roundtables. Um, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, if you are interested in providing a program or interested or have an idea for a program, um, you can, Michelle is actually not here tonight, but you can talk to any of us about your ideas, suggestions. Um, roundtables are run by Russ, um, who is retiring from roundtable duty this year. So if you're interested in uh, helping to run roundtables, uh, please talk to one of us and let us know. Um, also, we're looking for someone to help uh, Famita. Famita is actually taking over a publication of In the Spin. So if you're interested in working with her on publishing the newsletter, uh, let us know as well. Um, also, we want to thank uh, Ethan for volunteering for refreshments. Uh, so he's bringing refreshments for us. And Marilyn Santiestaban, who is our nomination chair for this year. Speaking of, no of, of nominations, uh, we have annual elections at SPIN. The elections will, are held in June of every year. Uh, so there will be elections next month. If you're interested in running for any of the offices, um, please let any one of us know um, or email us uh, from the website. If you're interested in doing that, if you're interested in finding out what uh, the uh, obligations are of each one, uh, you can find that on the website or again, talk to us or email us. So as I said, we're always looking for uh, new members of the team. Anyone, uh, refreshments has been filled. Nominations chair will be filled as well. If you're interested in newsletter or, well, or helping out with the round tables before the meetings, please let us know. Uh, we have a website. It tells you all the information about SPIN, meeting announcements, our newsletters, job postings, that sort of thing. Now, email registration, uh, there are two different lists we have. We have regular SPIN membership, which is you only get information about the meetings and our newsletters. That's it, nothing else. We also have an auxiliary uh, email, which is called SPIN Plus. And if people in the community are interested in sending things out about certain conferences or meetings, they will send to SPIN Plus. Or if you're interested in uh, signing up for that, you can do that as well. So this is what our website looks like and to join the regular SPIN mailing list only for meeting minutes and in the SPIN newsletter, um, that's here. And if you're interested in joining uh, in the uh, SPIN Plus mailing list as well, that's uh, over on the side of the bottom over here. Um, your emails are never sold. We're very conscientious about keeping them private. Uh, we're just having discussions about that just now. Um, you'll never get any advertisements or anything uh, from joining Boston SPIN. Um, we would like to thank our sponsors. Our hosting sponsor is MITRE, and they are fantastic giving us this, this terrific room every month to meet in. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sam and Chris. Our premier sponsor.
sponsor Big Visible Solutions, who provide agile solutions uh, in the Boston area. We have a broad offering of public classes, training, consulting, etc. Uh, thank you to Big Visible for being our premier sponsor. Uh, we have other sponsors as well, uh, Rally Software Development, Chaco Canyon Consulting, the Turnkey website, and Pay Monitor, and of course, Domino's Pizza. I'd like to thank them as well. Please turn off your cell phones, small children, noise-making devices, anything you have. That's the matter of the meeting. Um, we'd like to thank our roundtable facilitator for today. Um, topic was requirement tracking, management, magic, and myth. Who is Stephanie Beach? Where is Stephanie? We have a certificate here. Next month, uh, in June, on the 21st, we'll have Capers Jones, uh, a famous uh, speaker. We're lucky to have him come here. Um, talking about software metrics, we're not exactly sure what yet. So watch your email, and we'll be sending that out sometime very soon. Tonight's program, Transitioning to Scrum. For those of you who mentioned that you remember the wide world of sports from days gone by, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat uh, from Michael Ilamazza. So I'd like to introduce Michael. Let me hear you say, a boom, chicka boom. A boom, chicka boom. A boom, chicka boom. A boom, chicka, rock a chicka, rock a chicka boom. Great, that's one fantastic. I'd like everyone to stand up. And I'd like you to think of a number between one and ten. Think of a number between one and ten. Oh, just lock it in. Now find three other people who, th who thought of the same number. Just go ahead and do that. Find three other people who thought of the same number. We found nine. We found nine. We found
Okay? And I want to just be clear that these are not recommendations. Um, what works for me, what I think, might be radically different than what works for you and what you think. So a good question to ask is, what does a scrum coach do? Okay, and here's how I define what a scrum coach does. A scrum coach works to create an environment in which people and teams um, work at their best. Okay? So I'd like you to spend just a second thinking about a period of time in your life where you were at your peak. Right? Maybe a few months, a few weeks where you were at your peak. Okay? And then just put your hand back to signal where you were at your peak. Just put your hand where you signal where you were at your peak. Now put your other hand where you are currently. Put your other hand where you are currently. And just look around the room, right? Look around the room, right? So wherever you see a gap, right? That's a difference in potential. So this is very interesting. Two gentlemen here. Look at Joe. He's way up here on his peak performance and way down here in his current state. Your thoughts, Joe? Uh, when I was at my peak performance, I had very good people more of the day-to-day -day work than I used to be, instead of getting out and seeing people, I'm doing a lot of management. Okay. And my time has uh, become a little bit more limited. So I'm not performing as effectively as I used to. Right, right. Fantastic. And David, you are right there. You are at your peak. I am. Yes. Your uh, thoughts on that? How much time do you have to hear this? <laughs> uh, how much time would you guys like to give him? Three minutes. <laughs> It has a lot to do with expectations. So when I wake up in the morning, I am at my peak. The reason for that is I may not have as good memory as I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so the definition of peakness depends upon expectations. Okay, fantastic. Does anyone else want to comment? What? Yes, you want to comment. How did you know which of the first guy's hand was his one hand and which was his other hand? Oh, because I said the peak is the peak, and the other one is the current state. The peak is always going to be above. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. 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 Good question. All right. So what a scrum coach does is it helps people uh, create environments in which people at work can operate at their peak. So what's interesting to me about that is that we're not talking about improving skills necessarily, because you've already done it, right? It's just about spending more time there. And what's really interesting is that. Even though there's a fairly wide dynamic range in personal performance, there's an even wider range in team performance. Okay? So when teams are operating at their peak, it's almost always the case that they become world class, sort of in an absolute sense. Okay? It's very interesting. So in very short periods of time that these environments are created, a team that is so-so muddling through can go from that state to being not just much better than it was before, but much better compared to just about everyone else, in particular its competitors. So here's the value that I think this talk is going to have um, for you guys. And I'm going to check to see if this is actually true. How many people here know what velocity is? And how many people have seen a talk like this and seen a real velocity chart in those talks? Yeah, a lot fewer hands. So I'm going to show you some real data from real teams that I've coached, okay? It looks very different than the stylized stuff that you see. How many people know what a bug is? How many people have seen a bug analysis of a scrum team? Yeah, a lot fewer, okay? We'll also do a few exercises, and then we'll get an experience report from a professional uh, software developer who's been on multiple scrum teams. That's Ryan Martin. So very different perspective, right? I'm a guy who goes around trying to sell you scrum. Right? Ryan doesn't care about selling you Scrum, he cares about doing work, and he's been on multiple Scrum teams, so he's going to give you that perspective. And then also a perspective from Sean Kumar, who's a, currently a Scrum Master. So I'm going to start off by playing a little tiny game, the telephone game. Does anyone know what the telephone game is? Yeah. What's the telephone game? Oh my goodness, the guy gives me the conclusion before explaining the game to me. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I'm going to whisper into someone's ear a message, and that person's going to whisper into someone else's ear, and we'll do that throughout the talk. And at the very end, I'll ask what the last person heard say, okay? So it's going to run as a background process. Are you guys okay whispering things into each other's ears? Okay, that's okay. Minor culture, that's okay. Okay, I'm going to start over here. Are you okay?
Okay, so he's going to whisper it, and he's going to whisper it, and he's going to whisper it, and that's going to be going on throughout the talk, and then at the end, we'll discuss it with the last person. Okay, so I said I was going to start off with talking about the team, so I'll first start talking about the team, and then after a little while, I'll talk about coaching. I'm going to start off with uh, robustness, okay, robustness as opposed to optimization, okay? So one of the lessons I've learned coaching teams is that much of our schooling, uh, much of our financial life, much of our work life is about optimizing. Does anyone here have an MBA? MBA. So if you went to a traditional MBA, they'll talk about things like optimizing profits, okay? optimizing margins. Okay? You might have learned linear programming okay? to figure out how to get the optimum thing. And the same thing goes with teams. right? What is the fastest that we can do? And so one thing that I've learned is that in focusing on robustness instead of optimization is much more valuable. So I'll talk about that in the context of velocity. So here are sprints at the bottom. These are iterations for this particular team. It's two-week iterations, okay? And on the y-axis, we have story points. Story points are a measure of how much software our team is producing. Does anyone know here, what, what want to explain what story points are? Yes, David. Relative effort, relative complexity. So imagine that you're running a car factory, okay? And here are some questions that you might want to know about. You might want to know how long it takes to build a car. Okay? You may want to know how much money you make when you build a car. And you may want to know how many cars you're building per month. Okay? If we go into the software world, okay, asking how many hours it took to create a piece of software, reasonable question, easy to answer. How much money we, we make when we sell that software, reasonable question, easy to answer. Third question is, how much software are we producing per month? That's a much harder question to answer, right? Not obvious at all, okay? Does anyone actually have a proposal for how to answer that question? How much software are we building for what? Right? So that's what story points are, okay? That's what story points are, okay? They're a way of measuring, putting software on a scale, okay? So this is how much software, so more is better, okay? So this is a, a team that in the first three sprints starts producing about 50 story points, okay? And if you look at this point in time, which is 22 weeks later, they're producing close to 200 story points, okay? So this is something like a factor of 4x improvement over a period of about half a year, okay? If you talk to a per typical person who goes to an MBA school or a software manager, you know, a 10% performance improvement, 20% performance improvement over really long periods of time is considered exceptional. So this is interesting. So just to do some numbers, if we look at the last three sprints, there's 176% performance improvement. If we look at all the sprints except the first three, there's something like 145% improvement. So this is all sounds well and good. Except you notice that these are, there are these dips. And these dips are not small. They're massive, right? So the team goes from you know, 140 story points to 70 story points. Why does this happen? Sorry, what does that mean? Personnel left. Key personnel left? Miscalculation, misjudgment of what the task was. Miscalculation, misjudgment? They're not accounting for some things. Not accounting for some things? Didn't complete backlog items? Holidays and vacations. Holidays and vacations? Now, if a manager is paying someone to do Scrum, what might they do at this point? Right. Sorry? Get rid of something. Fire someone. Okay. Get a new coach. Okay. Would that be a conclusion, given that you can tell what the future is looking at this chart? Right. So here are some of these reasons for the spikiness. Right. Holidays, sick days, vacations, promotions. How about rebuilding machines? How many people have ever known a developer to spend a day or two rebuilding a machine? Yeah. Only a day. Only a day. Yeah. Or two. So I actually track these things for one team, and what I discover is that every single sprint, every single two-week period, one of these things happens. So these are not exceptions or occasional events. They happen all the time, right? So what that means is that if I'm trying to create a work system, right, I better create a work system that's robust with respect to these things, right? Because if I don't create a system that's robust with these things, with respect to these things, I'm going to get shredded every two-week period of time, right? These are not nuclear bombs that happen once a lifetime. 
These are things that are having every, er, happening every day. Right. So these things happen, and they cause all sorts of variants. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Coach, can I ask what a superficial retrospective is, please? Oh, what a superficial retrospective is. Yes. So first, what's a retrospective? Does anyone know the answer to that? So a retrospective is a point in time at the end of a sprint. Typically a sprint is a two week period of time. Sometimes it can be one week, sometimes it can be four weeks. Okay, in which we look back and we ask how we did. The technical team asks how we did. Okay? And often they're structured by asking three questions. What went poorly? What can be improved? Okay? And what went well? Okay? So a superficial retrospective is we go around the table and each person says one sentence. Right? We don't drill in and find the root cause, right? We don't say, oh, the problem is that two vice presidents hate each other, and so we can't get our work done, right? We say, you know, the coffee was too hot, right? That's what a superficial retrospective is. Here's a whole bunch of data from a team. Okay, I said I was going to show you bug reports of an actual team. So these are bug reports. This is bug per story point and bug per user story, okay? So you see massive fluctuations, right? In this sprint, the team, at least by this measure, produced 10 times as many bugs as in the previous sprint. Right? And so you see that all around. All of these things show lots and lots of movements up and down. Right? Lots and lots of spikiness. Lots and lots of volatility. Right? So I want teams, and I want systems, and I want a way of thinking which is robust with respect to this. Okay? So as a very simple rule, okay, here's one thing that many scrum teams will implement. Oh, thank you so much for that sound effect. Truck factor, okay? The truck factor is how many people need to be run over by a truck, okay, for the team to be in trouble. By the way, are we still whispering? Really? It stopped? Who's the last? Is it still going? It stopped the shot? You didn't get it. something that only I can do, I stop and pair with someone, okay? So there, there are always two people who can do a single thing, right? So when it comes to code, that means two people can modify that piece of code, okay? When it comes to creating a spreadsheet, that means there are two people who can create that spreadsheet. And often I'll, sit, I'll hear a comment that says, you know, we really, really need to meet this deadline, right? And the danger of that is there's always a deadline that needs to be met. There's always some pressure. So we never get robust, bo robustness. And so we create this super brittle organization in which there's this guy who can do this, there's this gal who can do that, there's someone, right? Everyone has a hyper area of expertise, right? And there is no robustness. So if one of them goes on holiday and one of them wants to get promoted, then we get absolutely shredded, okay? And the whole system falls apart. So a friend of mine who's an executive coach says, well, here's the standard. You are allowed to break the rule, but you're only allowed to break the rule if the team makes $10 million immediately, right? Other than that, you push back, okay? And it's the team making $10 million immediately. It's not the business making $10 million immediately, right? So you force this shared understanding, right? So you adopt this rule. This is a way of increasing robustness. Very forceful, very direct. Here's another great example. Special Forces A team, okay? So Special Forces A teams go out, Afghanistan, heard about their exploits, okay? It costs about $2 million a year to train them. There are 12 guys on an A team. They've got six specialties. Weapons, medics, communication, okay? Two guys, right? Two guys for each specialty. In addition to that, they're all cross-trained on each other's specialties. So they have some basic understanding, right? So what does that mean? If a firefight breaks out, does the medic sit on the side and say, I'm just gonna hang out here while, until one of you guys gets injured, <laughs> right? No, right, he starts shooting as well, right? And if some guy gets injured, right, Everyone helps them to have some ability to put on a band-aid while the medic comes in. Now that first example, these examples sound sort of funny, but how often does this happen on a team? Right? There's some database, and only the database guy can touch it. Right? So if the database thing is the most important thing that the team has to do, and that guy's on vacation, right, we have to all sit around, right? While the firefight is going on, and we're getting shredded by management, we're getting shredded by competitors, right? instead of actually being able to pick up a gun and shoot back, right? So it's very interesting to me that this extremely high performance team 
which has basically no bounds on how much money it can spend, right? Chooses to be organized in this way, right? Two guys per specialty. And I'll note that I think this would be a very interesting experiment for someone to perform. You know, 12 people is approximately the right size for a team. You know, imagine having a team which has, you know, two UI people, two database people, two front end people, two back end people, and they all have cross training with each other. Okay, that's a thought for how to organize a team, and it's a team that would be extraordinarily robust in the face of all sorts of circumstances. Yes, David. They'll do anything but pair programming. Yes, yes. So pair programming is the practice of sitting down on one keyboard, okay, with two people, and you switch. Okay. And the question is, what do you do? And I don't have an answer to that question. I don't have a magic potion. Um, what I can say is that pair programming is the most powerful way I know of transferring knowledge. And I wonder if your team would be willing to try for you know half a day um, to do pair programming with the deal that if they don't like it, they don't have to do it for another two weeks. <laughs> right? right? It's an extraordinarily powerful way of learning something. Um, one of the hardest transitions that I've seen on a team is that people think of themselves as being developers versus being testers. Okay? And I've had developers tell me, like, point blank, I would never do testing because it's beneath me. How many people know developers like that? So this is a huge, huge, huge impediment um, to achieving any sort of velocity and achieving robustness on a team. If you're not willing to do testing, and testing is the highest priority at some point in time, then that leads to just a spectacular amount of waste. So this is something that I've actually empirically observed on teams that I've worked with, which is that the number of QA people, people who only do QA, only do testing, is actually inversely proportional to quality. That's frightening. How many people here are QA people? Right? So that's what I've observed on the teams that I've been with. Right? If you've got five people who are QA only, ten people who are developers, versus a team in which there are 15 developer testers, on average what I've observed is that the 15 developer testers will do much, much better than the ones in which are split between the two parts. Okay? Does anyone want to argue with me about that? Oh, yes. Yes, so that's the exception that I've heard. The exception I've heard is that in certain situations when team performance is extraordinarily high, there are these very sort of specialized QA folks who can think about things such as performance and scalability in ways that other folks cannot. But you'll notice that you did not say manual testers, right? You did not say guys who sit down and follow a script and do a regression test every time, right? So it's very interesting to me that this is the case. So cross-functional people um, pay their rent in, back in space. So I wanted to mention just one simple way of focusing on robustness. One hard, wrong way to do it is to say, what's the worst thing that can happen? Because what's the worst thing that can happen? <clears throat> what? Company goes out of business. And right. Company goes out of business, you all get laid off. That's sort of a modest thing. I was thinking more like a nuclear bomb, right? So we, what we don't want to do is say we're robust to a nu nuclear bomb because then you know we'll never get anywhere, right? But a reasonable criteria is are we robust to things that happen once a year, <coughs> right? So that's something that's actually going to happen, right? It could actually negatively affect our business. And so create work systems where you ask yourself if this once a year event occurs, can we survive through it, right? And you can actually go ahead and collect data on things like this, okay? And as I say, I found that something like this happens every single two-week period, right? So it's actually more stuff that's more infrequent than this, right? And therefore more painful. And I want to build systems that are robust with respect to that pain. Yeah? What is unwillingness to reject story? What does that mean? Uh, yes. So if some requirement or some feature comes in, which is ambiguously defined, poorly defined, et cetera, instead of struggling through it, I reject it and say, you need to go think about this some more. Okay. 
So next I was going to talk about Ferry. This is also a team observation. So I'm going to give you a complete theory of communication and why human beings can't communicate in one slide. So here's a concept that this person has over here, idea B. And he wants to transmit it to some other human being. So there are two things that happen which guarantee that there will be a failure to communicate. The first is that this object is very complicated, right? It's multidimensional, right? But we communicate in language, which is a single dimension, right? So we have to take this super complicated multidimensional object and transmit it in a single string, okay? And then the other person on the other side has to do the reverse, right? He has to take this single string of language and recreate that extremely complicated object that was in the other person's head, right? And we have no consistent way of doing this. Computers actually do this, right? When we do client server, they can actually do this. They deserialize and serialize an object, but human beings can't do it. And even if we could do it, it would be super problematic because we're transmitting idea B, which is connected to idea A and idea 1 and everything that we've done before. And since our life experiences are different, right, we're not going to transmit all of that, so it's not going to be connected, even if we could recreate that object in the other person's head. Right? So we are guaranteed to never understand each other. Okay? We are guaranteed to never understand each other. Okay? And so there's a huge value in being unbelievably clear. Okay? So let me ask you, how many of you have showed up late to a meeting? Showed up late to a meeting? Okay. How many of you have showed up late to a meeting when you could have actually shown up on time? Yeah, yeah. Right? So what does it mean to show up on time to a meeting? Does someone want to define what that means? If you get a, a, a calendar invitation in Outlook, that says 9.30 to 10 a.m. What does it mean to be on time to that meeting? Be there at 9.30. Okay. Be there at 9 30. Arrive, early. Arrive early. Be there on time, ready to go. Be there on time, ready to go. Any other thoughts? Yes. Be there at 9.32. Be there when everyone else is there and the meeting starts. How many definitions are we up to? <laughs> okay. Five definitions on what it means to be on time for a meeting. Right? And this causes massive amounts of friction right, in a company. Right? Constant misunderstanding. If we cannot agree on what it means to be on time to a meeting, imagine if we actually had to agree on something slightly complicated. Yes, Jim. <laughs> It depends on who's calling a meeting. Yes. The definition of time depends on how much money the guy who called the meeting makes. Yeah. Or if you can dial in at the same time. Or if you can dial in at the same time, right? You can be on time because you're on the phone. Okay? So clarity. Here's, it. Here's how it works in the places where I coach. Your thoughts on that? Right, so it's perfect clarity, right? We have a meeting that starts in this room, starts at 1.30, I'm in that room, you are not, it's 1.31, you're in violation of our agreement. How many people would like to implement this in your workplace? Look at this, look at this, look at this. Clarity, okay, this is what clarity looks like. Here's a daily stand-up. Daily stand-up is a 15-minute meeting at the beginning of the day. The whole team stands up and answers typically three questions. Okay? We have an agreement for what we do in this meeting. Okay? So this is something that I do with all of my team. Okay? Everything that we do repeatedly, produce something, have a meeting, we have an agreement about what it means to do that. So this is a 15-minute meeting. Stand up, starts, begins, answer three questions. You think, wow, it's the simplest thing in the world. Okay? We start at 9.30, we end at 9.45. Obvious, right? We book the room from 9.30 to 10 a.m. We answer these three questions. Now we get an interesting one. We do not judge or evaluate. We do not judge or evaluate. Right? Interesting rule, right? This all comes from the team itself, by the way. This takes about an 80 minutes to, took about 80 minutes to get this down. Okay? Just a collective discussion about what it means to have an excellent meeting in the morning. Okay? Do not judge or evaluate. That actually came from someone who felt that he was being judged and evaluated all the time in his 15-minute meetings. And he was an engineer who thought that the product manager would show up 
and tell him what he was doing right and wrong. So he put this rule in. Okay? I asked all of the members of the team from one to five to explain how happy they are. This guy instantaneously went from a one, like almost quitting the company, to a 3.5. Okay? Because of this one, two, three, four, five word rule. Okay? That's one of the things that clarity does for you. And it just goes on and on and on about like that. Okay? We talk on the polycom where it's available. We set up screen sharing with this thing. Okay? So we have this sort of agreement for every meeting that we make and every product that we create, everything that we do repeatedly. Okay? So there's crystal clear understanding of what it is that we're doing. Commitment. So at the beginning of a sprint, a team commits to doing so much work. Okay? In this particular case, there are these numbers that refer to these things. right? And we don't just sort of say, hey, is everyone okay with this? Right? Because then what happens? What happens if you say, hey, is everyone okay with this? Yeah. People nod without really having their hearts in it, right? And so we commit, we explicitly commit, right? We make a handshake agreement, right? We type it in and we say, I commit to doing this. This is at the end of a three hour meeting which we've been discussing what we're gonna be doing for the next two weeks. And here's what's fascinating to me. After all of that, there's one person who thinks that one of the items might actually not be met, right? So if we were just asking people in general and having people nod up and down, Right? That guy probably would have nodded up and down. And now we see that there's a disagreement. And then we can refer to this. Right? We can say, oh, we as a team have a collective agreement to do these things. Right? These are the simplest possible things. Right? You can say, wow, agreeing to what we're going to do in the next two weeks. And yet this sort of thing happens all the time. Engineering practices. How many people here are engineers? How many people here know an engineer? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's this practice of building the software, okay? Collecting all the little bits and pieces and producing a build that someone can actually use, okay? These are three or four top-notch developers. These are all senior developers or architects. They're all chatting about some build that they're doing, right? And at the very end, someone then says, how does one define incorrect build, right? So this sort of thing, this understanding is happening all the time in companies, right? What do you mean by this word that we're using all of the time, right? So just very simple things. Let's define what we're doing. Let's define what good looks like. Let's define what a beginning of a meeting, what the end of a meeting looks like. So I'm going to now turn it over to Ryan. Okay? Ryan is an experienced developer. He's been on multiple teams. And I wanted him to give you his perspective on this because his perspective is radically different from mine. And I thought that you guys would appreciate hearing from him. It's going to be very tough to follow his enthusiasm and his energy. I have to work with him every day, and he's always like that, which is excellent. That's good, but it's going to be tough for me to follow him and have any confidence doing so. So I've worked at um, my last three companies. We did Agile in all of them, and I have three very different experiences between all of them. Um, they're all in this area. Uh, if I said the names, you would know all the companies. They're pretty successful companies, around 200 people in each one of them, and they all make around 75 million a year, give or take. So the first company I worked at, I brought Agile in. And uh, I wasn't asked to do so. I just you know, heard about it, started reading about it, so I brought it in. Probably wasn't the best, most you know, strict way to do it, but I, I wanted to make an attempt at it. I brought some other stuff in, uh, continuous integration, so the engineers here probably know what that is. So the problem that I had right off the bat was we only had three people on the team. And I found out right away, doing Agile with three people does not work. You really need a product owner. You need a QA person, a couple engineers. You need to have a team. So having three engineers do it wasn't really productive. It was actually counterproductive. We had a lot of time doing meetings and meeting up, and we all sat right next to each other. So it was kind of pointless. So that was my first experience, but uh, it got me hungry. And I noticed a lot of good things, so I liked it. So from there, I ended up leaving the company, which I loved, because I wanted to learn more about Agile. So I went to a company that was strict Agile. Kench Weber uh, came and taught the whole company Agile, and he's actually one of the inventors of Agile. So I was excited to go there and um, learn from Ken Schwaber and a company that's been doing it for like three or four years uh, quite successfully. So my experience there was horrible. And the problem was the team was all about doing Agile. They did everything correctly, followed it right to the letter of the law. The problem was upper management wasn't on board. They weren't doing Agile. So, when we did, when we said commitments, and we said we're going to bring in, you know, all these stories, after two weeks, if we missed on a couple of them, upper management was mad at us. We never once got all of the stories done, and it was very difficult. 
you know, one thing I could say to you is when you leave here, tell me which time you're going to get to your front door. So the exact minute. Is anyone here going to be right? So how do you want me to tell you after, you know, three, four weeks that I'm going to get all of this work done? What's the uncertainty that comes with engineering? So we're always in trouble, but we still did Agile, you know, as a team. And what I learned there, and I loved, was the camaraderie. You know, you either succeed together or you fail together. So that was a great thing. The team all really, st you know, set up for each other. We would help each other out. We would work over the weekends just to help someone else out so someone else, you know, would get their work done. So that was a good bonding experience, and that was another stepping stone in Agile that I really enjoyed and I want to continue doing. So those are my first two experiences. One, the team was too small. It wasn't really a team built for Agile. So three people probably doesn't cut it. And then the other one was upper management wasn't on board. So if the company's going to do Agile, I think everyone really has to be on board. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to be successful, and you're not going to be happy. So now that brings me to the company I'm at now, which is extremely efficient, effective, very productive. Um, we're doing Agile, management's on board, uh, vice president, 100% all about Agile, and CTO, and everyone's on, on board with it. So right now, those tracks you're showing you is the company I work at now. We're just produce, producing code unbelievable. And, and it really is because of Agile. And I, I think it took a while for us to get there, as you saw at the beginning, to the end. And it is a process, and it takes a while. Um, the one thing I think that helps us be successful is all the engineers on the, on the team have 10 years. So we're all very experienced. Um, there's a couple of guys that are, you know, are new, but the majority, everyone's very experienced. So I think that helps bring Agile on board. Um, we do have distributed teams, so our, our, our QA testers are over in Kiev. So that was a learning process, and that took a while for us to be able to integrate them into the Agile process. So there's been a lot of bumps, but we've learned to integrate it and fix it and the retrospective helped with that. So at the end of two weeks, what, what's not working? Well, the Kiev team is not really involved. We feel like we don't even know who they are. They don't exist. They send us emails saying something's broke. So we fix that. So that, for instance, is one, one scenario that happened where there's numerous other ones. So the retrospect, we always look back and say, what can we fix? And we kept fixing the process. And then when you saw the chart earlier, I don't know if you're really paying attention, but like we're just producing software at a rapid rate that's I've never seen before, and everyone else in the company never seen before. And there's 100 engineers there, and everyone is just shocked that the team that I'm on were being so productive. So there's like three or four of the teams, and everyone's trying to figure out what we're doing different that they're not doing different. Um, so they, now they're going to start doing that job. So that's really what the difference is. So that's my point of view from a uh, software engineer. I, I can't picture ever working in Waterfall again. Um, I will always work in that job. It works for me. and. Uh, I guess that's it. Can you talk a little bit about So that's a great question. And the fact that we have a very experienced product owner who writes very descriptive stories and the use cases, uh, the, the crystal clear, uh, helps. So if we have something that was a lot of ambiguity and a lot of gray area, we could waste days and days and days building something that was incorrect. So I think it's very important whether you're doing Agile or not doing Agile or doing Kanban or Lean, having a product owner who gets it and who writes the proper user stories. So that's one of the reasons why we are so successful is because of our product owner writing the correct use cases and user stories. Why do you think the experience of the engineers matters? I mean, given that they had done Agile before? Right. What, why do you think that, that's a factor? So, other than what Michael's been speaking about, in my mind as an engineer, there's a lot of other things that come with agile development, not just from continuous integration, um, code coverage, uh, all types of testing. So there's a lot of best practices that I look at as an engineer that fall under the agile umbrella, um, test-driven development, behavior-driven development, all of that stuff. And we brought all of that on board, and it's helped the team out tremendously. So looking at it from an engineering point of view and a technology point of view, other than just the scrum stuff, which is the process, and like we're speaking about, that stuff is great and that helps. I look at the other tools and try to bring it all in, and you really need, they're all going to be experienced, but you need a good, a good amount of them to be experienced, because everyone has to be able to pick up right away. Then we don't do a lot of training, because training can slow you down. So we were able, within like six months, to be like super productive, where if we had you know, probably more junior developers, there would have been more mentoring and more hand-holding, so it would have took longer. Okay, thanks. Well, you mentioned that at some point you ran something that we, what was the special thing that you did? 
you know, it was a very simple, easy thing, and it was start talking to them. I, I, I think we didn't want to talk to them because probably we didn't want to hear what was broken, and we didn't. We wanted it. It was almost like they weren't even part of the team. You know, they're, they're global logic. They're all in, you know, Kia. They're not part of, you know, company A where I work at. So we had to stop looking at it that way. They are part of the team. They're equals. We're all in it together. So you know, a lot of us had to come to work earlier because they, you know, they work till noon. And I, I get up at six at home, and right away I get on Skype, and I find out, do you guys have any blockers? Do you need any help? And you know, started speaking to them with their first names before there really was people that would put bugs in the system. So it was a culture thing. You know, we had to look at them as equals and bring them on the team. And at, we didn't do that at first. So it was a really a growing up part of, for us, and we had to do that, which that's what we did. So the last company I was at before this one, we did four week sprints. So this one we're doing two week sprints. So I've done both. Um, I, I I personally like four weeks better. Um, I've been pushing for it at work. All the other engineers are very happy doing two weeks because we've been so successful. Everyone's like, well, why, why rock the boat? Everything's working well. I, I really like the four week sprint because there's a lot of meetings. I mean, there's a grooming meeting, there's a planning meeting, those are eight hours each. There's the retrospective, there's the review, there's a demo. So if I'm having all of these meetings in two weeks, I feel like I'm losing a lot of time that I could be writing code and I can be being productive. So that's my point of view of like, I like four weeks better. People like the two weeks better because you have less time to waste on building something. So after two weeks, I can show you a feature and you can either say, that's junk, we're not gonna use it, or let's, let's change gears and go somewhere else with it. So there's less time to really waste with the two weeks. Does it change the quality of the story now? The no, 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 you're just taking more stories. So a lot of, so if you have a story that's a 13 or a 21, so the the stories go one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, Fibonacci. So if you have a 21 or a 13, you're really supposed to break it out more because it means it's too complex and it, and that would also allow you to have more bugs because it's not clear. This is, you know, this is too complex. I, I, it's a 21. Well, let's break it on into a bunch of threes and a bunch of fives so we know exactly what's supposed to be there. So you would bring in a lot more stories if you did four weeks. So it wouldn't affect the stories. In either your experience or maybe just your opinion, is there a difference in the effectiveness of this method with, uh, in a company which is producing software as a product versus <clears throat> a company which, or an organization producing software for some internal support, for example, supporting a bank or an insurance company, uh, an auto manufacturer or something? I don't, I, is there a way you can repeat the question? So, we can't hear. so you're asking, who the, who the customer, who the client is, whether it's a real customer, whether it's an internal customer in the company, or whether you're building software for the public, is that, was that? Yes, are you building software for the public consumption, or are you building software for uh, use within the company, which is producing something else uh, for the public? So either scenario, whether you're building it for internal use, so the salespeople could be your customer, the marketing could be your customer, or you're building it for the public, or you're building it, you know, you're, you're a contractor or a service provider for someone, you know, one other company, it, it doesn't matter. So if you're gonna do Agile, you're, you're still gonna deal with the same thing. You have one product owner who's giving you direction, and that's the most important thing. Whether you're building for mass consumption, you're building for one person, you have one product owner who's taking all of the requirements throughout the company, he's putting a business value on it, so you always know what's the most important thing I should be working on, so there's no ambiguity there. You, Business value goes from 100 to uh, 1,000. So you should always be working on the highest business value um, first. So that, that that's very important too. So the who the customer and the client is doesn't really matter. You're listening to your product owner who's giving you the direction of what's the most important work on. Do you do pair programming? No, what you said earlier is exactly what we had. I want to do pair programming and all the uh, engineers who have been there the longest, they're very stubborn, they don't want to do it. And I think, I think it's an issue with um, maybe pride. They don't want someone to tell them that they're doing something wrong or the code's not good, which is not the point of pair programming. You know, as Michael mentioned, it's really doing uh, cross-domain knowledge. You know, having someone else get used to an area that they're not used to, and also looking for bugs. It's another, it's another bug catcher. So some people still look at it that way, and they'll never ever do it. But we've been trying to bring it in, and it's not going to happen. Do you have any QA people locally? Is the team shared in the split? So that's another thing that fixed the issue that we had with the overseas. We brought someone in in-house, which was very important. So now 
she is now talking to them regularly. She is the li liaison between the, them and us, and she sits right with the development team, and that made a huge difference. So I do think having at least minimally, if you're going to go overseas, and a lot of companies are now doing that because it's very cost cost effective, it, it's great to have a resource right next to you who's managing the overseas team instead of having these developers who are not that great management anyways, them trying to manage you know the overseas uh, QA team. So we do have someone there who's managing it, and it's made uh, our lives a lot easier. And, um is there any, if any talks that you want four weeks and the team wants two, how about going to three split the difference? I've tried that too. Everyone's just very, like, we're very, very, it's unbelievable how productive we are and there's no issues, there's nothing to complain about, everything is absolutely great. So nobody wants to change anything. You know, even in the retrospective today, I was a, a scrum, scrum master and, you know, he said, what are we going to talk about? Everything was, you know, this past spring we produced 200 story points, that was double of anything we've ever done. So there's really not a lot to talk about that went bad. Things are going really well. Uh, we have a technical writer. Um, so I, I believe in doing documentation functional and technical. One thing I've realized is right up there, write it about a week later, it's outdated. So now we leave a lot of the um, um, documentation in the code. If you comment the code well, that should carry it. So, we stopped doing that because I found I wrote a 50 page document and they were literally useless months later. So, we did hire a um, technical writer who was, who was, yeah, for the customers so they know how to use the software and what we're building. Yeah. No, they don't. And that's actually a good point. We probably should stop bringing them in. Uh, I think it's at a different phase of the product, so when we get closer to the end, that we would probably end up bringing him in, let him listen, and we show the demo, this is what's built. But I, I do think he's getting direction from the product owner also, so he knows what's being built all along, and he's probably writing all along, so that's probably why he's not showing up, but it wouldn't hurt, definitely be good to make a part of the team. What's the size of your team? The team's pretty big, and that's another issue we're having. It's, it, we keep hiring, which is great, the company's doing well, so the team's up to like 13 or 14, but it's starting to get really big, so our 15 minute, is now 45 minutes, and I did stand up is getting too big. So I think we're talking about splitting the team up now and have two teams. So that will be something to try to, there'll be obstacles there. We have to overcome them and you know, tweak it and make it optimal, but if we're going to split the team up, it's too big. So it's 10 local and four over and good. Yeah. I, you know, I'm going to let John go, and if anyone has any questions for me, I, I'll answer all of them. A sense of the fact that it's high performing is not good enough. Uh, I had to validate that for myself. So I had uh, multiple ways of validating that. One was, uh, you know, this. Uh, okay. One was this uh, Scrum checklist by, uh, you know, Nieberg. And uh, on the second day of my work, I kind of uh, started, uh, you know, uh, uh, checking this off, and I could see that there were more green check marks than, than there are uh, red, and then you know there are question marks. But this kind of said that man, we are more scum compliant than than most teams are. But this wasn't good enough uh, for me, you know. Like James Bond says, uh, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is really enemy action. So, so I had to find other ways of validating the same uh, thing for myself. Uh, I kind of uh, looked at uh, the the, scrum, uh, the Nokia scrum test, and uh, uh, you know we scored pretty high on this. We kind of did uh, almost 80 percent. Eight out of ten is what we got. That uh, was highly, uh, you know, that kind of validated us. Uh, I kind of made a report about this to uh, the management, and I think every other team now is being evaluated on uh, you know uh, the Nokia scrum test to see how scrum compliant that they are. Um, Finally, when I got a chance doing the first retrospective, uh, I went to the assumption that high-performing teams have fun, uh, they enjoy themselves. So one of the questions I asked is, how much fun you're having at work? And this is the kind of answer that I got. They were all fours and fives. And they're definitely more than the average of, uh, you know, between four and five. So uh, a very simple, very innocuous question kind of validated the fact that these guys are having fun. So they're producing great work. and. Uh, you know, but what one doesn't see behind that is uh, even the team didn't know that they were doing great work because there's no way to measure it. Uh, so I remember uh, they were doing all these scrum ceremonies. They were doing two-week sprints. Uh, they were doing user stories. 
but they are not gotten into user uh, story pointing. And that's something that I know Michael kind of introduced that. It was very hard you know, to tell them about story point, uh, what it meant, because story point by itself doesn't mean anything, just a measure of complexity and, and the size. So, but to get those people to start using story points was uh, uh, a challenge. And then to start measuring velocity, uh, which again, you know, uh, is not an easy thing. And once we start having a measure of what our velocity is, then it is possible for us to start doing things that will start giving us better velocity. Uh, things like smaller stories. Uh, smaller stories means lesser bugs, less uh, back and forth between the QA team and our teams, which means less amount of rework, so more time for us to do real stories. So, you know, things that we could see uh, happening uh, in front of us, which is what uh, I thought was the real value in terms of knowing where we are, knowing the velocity. And now that we all know what the velocity is, and uh, you know, it's evident for us as well as uh, the management, what the team is capable of, so we know how good we are. Hey, uh, we are a high performing team, that doesn't mean that everything is fixed, there are no things to fix, but uh, it's good to know that uh, you know, things are happening well. Uh, but you know, there are always more uh, bigger peaks to conquer and uh, more things to do. So that has been my experience so far. It has been good. And you know, given the fact that in the past that I've been asked to you know, recover or rescue floundering teams, this is an entirely new experience for me. So I'm very grateful for that. Thanks. So I was going to finish up by talking about some coaching experiences I have. These are things that I've learned that I need to do to be an effective coach. So I'm going to talk about cleanliness. I need to be clean in my work. Here's my model of my brain. I have limited cognitive capacity. I said I, was not, well, I, said I wasn't going to argue, um, but I'm wondering if anyone wants to argue with me on this. No arguments. Everyone agrees I have limited cognitive capacity. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, I only have two working neurons. Right? So a good question to ask is, should one of those be keeping track of where my keys are? Right? And my answer is no. Right? And so what cleanliness helps me do is I allow myself to focus my entire brain on hard problems, and I arrange everything else to be as simple as possible. How many people here have wallets? Okay. How many of you arrange the, your wallets in some certain way? Yeah. Oh, what, someone tell me, what do you, what do you do? Yes. How many people do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so she, her husband arranges the money in a certain way so that he knows how many bills of each type he has, right? So this is something that human beings are constantly doing, right? We're changing the world to make it cognitively easy for us to navigate in that world, okay? And so I think it's, whoa, this is an example of variance, right? Yes, David. Cognitively easy or easier? Easier, thank you for the correction, yes. So as easy as possible, right? We're constantly doing this. We radically prefer uh, making things easier. So here are some of the things I do. Inbox zero. How many people know what inbox zero is? What's inbox zero? Gentlemen. Getting everything out of your inbox folder, yeah. email, and some other folder of the traffic. Right. How many people do that? Yeah. So one of the things that forces me to do is to have very organized things. So here's you know, the mobile team here on their screens, here are your individual days. If I was allowed to keep everything in my inbox, I wouldn't have to do that. Another thing, clean desk, right? So you know, all the other scrum masters of the company know that if they look at my de uh, my desk, you know, they know exactly where to find the polycom, right? Because it's there every time. If it's not there, it's because I'm using it, right? So clean desk, checklists, even for the simplest possible things, right? When I was a pilot, I was amazed. I had this pilot that had been 10,000 hours in the air, right? And he had a checklist for trivial things, like check the tires. And he actually physically took out the checklist and went through each one of them, even though he had done it hundreds of times. Right? And there are actually studies that show that doctors who use checklists make fewer errors in surgery than people who don't. 
right? So here's a checklist for this stand-up, which is this 15-minute meeting, like simplest possible meeting, right? Here's my checklist. I send a Skype message showing the screen sharing. I set up the, um, the polycom system, which does the thing with the folks out offshore. I set up a hardwired internet. I close Outlook, and I put this on a 3x5 cart, and I take it out. Look at this. Here's the meeting checklist for the Boston Spin, right? <laughs> Written down, right? A wonderful tool, right? Put everything on it, right? So you can give it to anyone, right? Even the bottle of water is on there, right? Phenomenal tool, phenomenal cognitive tool to reduce complexity, right? Make things easier, right? Here's one that's much harder, okay? One thing I discover is that when I'm talking to teams and when I'm talking to the managers, they want to know things like, what has this person told you? What has this person told you on this date? What happened with this artifact and this role in this organization, right? And if I just have a simple notebook, it's, I have to page through the notebook every single time. Right, so I would love to have an information system which allows me to slice and dice. So I can just say, give me every conversation that I've had with this person in this particular sprint about this particular artifact. Okay? I haven't quite reached there, but this would be super useful to have. And I know about a tool that maybe helps me do that. Self-care. I have to take care of myself. You know, one of the things that I'm constantly doing in an organization is confronting impediments, right? arguments. Right? I'm always in the mud. Right? In fact, if I'm not in the mud, that means I'm not doing something well. Right? I'm constantly discovering dysfunction and clearing it. Right? So I have to take care of myself right? because I'm constantly in this situation. So I track my happiness. So this is happiness getting happier and happier and happier. Right? Here's muddling through. Okay? So five days a week, I get more depressed, and then I'm happier two days a week. Five days a week, more depressed. Have, why is it five days, two days, five days, two days? <laughs> okay, okay. So, so you know that you're in this pattern if you're a guy and you go home and you watch Sports Center and drink a beer, right? And if you're a gal, you might go home and watch Lifetime movies and eat Ben and Jerry's and eat Twizzlers, right? Right? So if you're doing that, right, you're medicating yourself, right? You're in this situation, right? That's what I do, right? That's what I do. I'm muddling through. And here's Doom, right? Right? So when I notice myself in these patterns, I have to do something. So here's how I know. I'm forgetful. I take my laptop over the weekend and I forget to bring it in the morning on Monday. How many people have forgotten to bring their laptop into work? Yeah. So that's a sign that I'm in this doom. Sleepiness, accident, sloppiness. Okay? One very important rule that I've learned is that stopping when I'm just at my limit is far, far, far better than toughing it out. Right? So I once actually toughed it out when I was lifting weights. And now I have like a busted spine, right? That's like a permanent lifelong damaging injury. Another place that I found is very useful is in conversations. Right? Have you ever had a conversation with someone where they were talking too much? How many people have had a conversation? How many people have never had a conversation with someone who's talking? Uh, okay. And so here's what I found in observing myself is that I, there's a point at which they, I feel like they're talking too much, but I just sit there and listen to them. And, then, and finally, I'm so irritated that I have to say something, right? And it's much, much better for me, much better for the other person, if at the moment that I reach my limit, I say, you are speaking more than I enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because at, at that moment, I say, you're speaking more than I enjoy. Right? And then the pain stops. I'm happy and the other person's happy. Right? right? So knowing what my limits are and bounding them by my limits. Now, I'm at... 810, which is, I think is when I said I was going to stop. There's a question and answer here. We've had lots of questions. So I'm wondering if you guys give me permission to end. Can I do a few more slides to get permission? Okay. So here are examples of self-care. Going to sleep was a great one for me. Um, talking with friends. Massage, meditation, doing something small that works. Right? So these are things that increase my happiness. Right? And I dial them up. Right? Like, I get more massages when I'm depressed. Right? I sleep more when I'm depressed. Right? Because I monitor myself and I want to make sure that I'm happy. Right? So that's something that's very important that I've learned. And finally, I'm just going to end with um, a few small coaching koans. These are just small phrases that I use and repeat to myself. So one of them is to value connection over solution. Okay? How many people have gotten into an argument at work? Yeah. How many people have gotten? Yeah. Right? So one thing that I've learned is that we're constantly, or at least I find myself constantly, searching for answers, searching for solutions, and sometimes I'm in disagreement with someone. 
And my view will be, well, here you're wrong for these 25 reasons, right? As opposed to doing something else, which is the valuing my connection with that person, valuing being understood and understanding that person, right? So instead of taking the position, my goal is to win this argument, I take the position, my goal is to understand this person and to be understood by that person, right? How many people here like open workspaces? Open workspaces. How many people here like closed workspaces? Closed workspaces. How many people here are passionate fans of open workspaces? Are you willing to be a volunteer? Okay, here's a volunteer, okay? So I'm a, a fan of closed workspace. Dan is a fan of open workspace, all right? So talk to me about why you want to have an open workspace. So what I like about open workspaces is, is, is having the conversations that are going on really quickly. And also, when other people are talking, I, I can participate in listening and learning something from them. Okay, I just wanna, I'm just going to stop you before you just continue. Like, let me tell you like, why you're completely wrong. <laughs> you're, you're completely wrong, right? So I need silence. I need peace. I need quiet. I don't want to be listening to anyone else, okay? They disturb me. I have to work from home. It's a horrible idea to have a workspace. You're just so stupid. You just don't understand <laughs> the way people work. Right? This interaction is offending me right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but are you actually uh, knowing with other people in the room are doing, and are you learning from that? Because that's what, what I get, you know? We don't go but so all far. All they do is interrupt me. Okay, stop talking to me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's try another way. Okay, let's try it next. We're going to rewind. We're going to rewind. Yeah. Why do you like open workspaces? So again, I like open workspaces because uh, I, I get to hear what's going on and get a lot of information through osmosis. Right. So yeah. what I hear you saying is that you really value communication right. and collaboration with other human beings. Mm -hmm. You do this presumably because you want efficiency in the workplace. Right. Okay. So you notice a completely different tenor of those two conversations, right? The difference between trying to understand another human being as opposed to overpowering them, being stronger than they are, right? Being right versus them being wrong, criticizing, humiliating versus understanding. Thank you so much. Sure. So that's one. Beyond my ability to help. So I would like to be so good at what I do that I can contribute in, any, in every environment. But that's not the case, okay? Sometimes I can't contribute. And one of the biggest mistakes I can make is to consistently pound my head against a problem that I don't have the ability to solve, right? So I have to know when there's a situation that's beyond my ability to operate in. And I have to have, be open enough to have the courage to say, I can't do anything in this. I need help. Agreement without giving in. Okay. Yes, there's the lion roar, right? So very often in situations uh, at work, okay, what will happen is that someone will turn the other cheek or give up what they want and what they need, okay? And being able to navigate through these environments, right, where everyone's voice is heard, right, where everyone's opinion is respected, right, as opposed to a situation in which, you know, the highest paid person in the room or the person with the most power Okay, just overpowers everyone, over argues everyone. Um, it's a very valuable. Copy my movement. Okay, um, when working with absolute novices, right, in just about any field, right, what the expert instructor does is say, just do what I do, just do what I do. Okay, um, when you're learning cursive, when you're learning handwriting, when you're learning how the alphabet, when you're learning how to dance, how to play the violin. Right? You just say, we're going to learn the scales. We're going to do exactly this. And we're going to do it over and over again. So a very powerful technique that I found very useful. Um, communicating through conflict. Um, if a team can communicate through conflict, okay, then it gets to this extraordinary situation where essentially nothing that it does is harmful to the team. Right? So sometimes if you're, if you're on a typical team, typical team, you'll have a violent disagreement people will start hating each other and disliking each other. But if the team develops the ability to communicate through conflict, then if it's successful, the team gets stronger and bonds more. And if it discovers a conflict, it clears that conflict and it gets closer. Right? So no matter what it does, 
right? The team gets better and better and better, right? So this is actually an amazing situation, right? It's an amazing situation because you can dial things up to the point where you know, no one has ever had this experience. So I'm working with right now with a team which two months ago was almost fired, right? Two months ago, the team was almost completely fired. And I was just talking to the product owner today, and I asked him, you know, what are the biggest problems? The biggest problem was that the team was not shipping. It was just not shipping software month after month after month. No matter how easy it was, it was just not shipping software. And we shipped software in the first sprint, in the first two weeks. We shipped software in the second two sprints. And today I told them, you know, we can probably start shipping software every week. You know, from not shipping software to shipping software every two weeks to shipping every week. And I said, you know, after we do that, we may be able to ship every single day, right? Which is something that only absolutely world-class organizations have the ability to do. You know, ship a product every single day with incremental features, right? Very, very few companies can do that. And we have the shot of doing this. And what he said to me was, actually, I don't want to ship every day. So we've gone from a point where the team was almost fired for not being able to ship to a point where they're not telling us, wow, we can do this so well that we don't want to keep going in that direction, right? So that's what happens. You know, you can do amazing, amazing things where you get to this point where everything that you do strengthens the team because it has these abilities to actually sit in a conflict and get stronger when it's in the conflict instead of getting weaker. How do you get to that point? Ah, so I can't answer that question in a second. Um, it's a whole set of practices and um, principles and values that get sort of applied over time. Sorry? Is there a reference? Um, so one technique that I found that's very useful. Hire you. What? Hire you. Um, so I don't want to leave it at that. Um, so um, one tool that I found is extremely powerful is a technique called NDC, nonviolent communication, which you can um, Google based on some work that God needed. Um, yes, sound effects. So one great defect that I had for like the first 35 years of my life is that I thought I was special. That's a big mistake, isn't it? Right? At least I thought it was for me. It's a big mistake. And the problem with thinking that I'm special is that it means that things don't apply to me. So this has happened to 9 out of 10 people or 99 out of 100 people, but I'm going to be that 1 out of 100 person for whom that doesn't apply. And so I kept making mistake after mistake after mistake because I thought I was special. And so once I concluded that, you know, Maybe, 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 if I have a lot of evidence that I'm special in this particular situation, I'm special. But most of the time, the default assumption should be that my experience is going to be exactly like everyone else's experience, right? And so I can learn from others, among, among other things, instead of thinking that I'm the exception to the rule. So I want to conclude just with this statement that you know the goal of a coach is to support people and teams in their quest to become their best selves. And I've talked about you know, my observations on teams, my observations on coaching. Um, I think I'm going to pass out um, some evaluation form. I'm also happy in the last five minutes to take a couple of questions, and I'll hand out books to a couple of the people who um, who return evaluation forms. Yes. Um, if the job were to create a system that's human-like, safety critical, yes. Yeah. Real time. Yeah. Right, so actually the best person in the Boston area to talk about is Nancy B. Um, so if you give me, she does exactly this, um, you know, for places like Lincoln Lab. Um, so I would suggest that you talk to her. So if you send me your email, I'll yeah, let you know. So actually, I do have one practice that I can share with you, actually in response to this person's question. What's your name? Carol. Carol, Carol asked this question about um, how do you create environments in which people can communicate through conflict? So there's this wonderful book by Blanton called Radical Honesty. Um, it's, it's a wild trip if you're not familiar with um, Agile Ideas. But um, one of his views is that when two human beings know each other in detail, they fall in love. Okay? So one practice, what? Radical Honesty um, by Blanton. It's a book. So here's a four-minute practice that I'm going to suggest that we try now. If you try this with every single member of your team, my experience is that um, you'll radically improve team cohesion bonding, okay? So here's the, you pair up with someone. So go ahead and pair up with someone. And one person is going to go first, 
and they're going to talk about the biggest problem that they have. And they're going to talk about that problem for one minute, and the other person is just going to listen. Okay? You're just going to listen. You're not going to try to solve the problem. You're not going to be thinking about solutions. Your goal is just to understand the other human being. Okay? Just understand the other human being. Okay? So for one minute, go ahead and talk, and I'll tell you when it's over. Okay, time is up. It's amazing how long a minute is when you're talking about the biggest problem you have, right? Okay, now the other person is just going to reflect back what they heard you say. Just a pure reflection of what they heard you say. No interpretation, no solution. Right? The other person is just going to say, I understood you to say, right? Just understanding. Just reflect back understanding, and you have now a minute. Go ahead and do that. you were understood, right? And keep your hand up if you felt that you were understood in a way that you were not understood at work at any time. <laughs> Today, you know, right? So it's just very interesting. And then you would switch, right? The important thing is to be completely silent while the other person is speaking, right? And to focus 100% on understanding, not solution, right? Just understand the other human being, right? So that's a technique that you can use if you do it with every pair of people on your team. And you do it every day, you know, just a four-minute exercise. You would switch after this, of course. Um, it'll be um, almost certainly a radical bonding experience. So thank you very much, and thank you for Spin for inviting me. What happened to Telecom? Oh, the story, the story. Oh, yes, thank you so much. So who was the last person to hear today? Here. Here? Okay, so what did you hear? Today is a good day to talk about Scrum. Today is a good day to talk about Scrum, okay? So what I said is, Today is a wonderful day to learn about Agile principles and practices. <laughs> okay, so two books. These are. Um, oh, okay. Oh, we have we have many raffles. So you, you have more, even more prizes. Oh, okay, you are. Okay. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Oh yes, that's a good point. <laughs> Optional, but not if you want to win the prize. So these my books. Okay. All right. So these are books for geeks. So you're. Um, let's see. Okay. Here's one. Oh. Oh, there's one. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Let's see. Um, Giselle, is that, is that right? Banner, okay. Is this a book that you would enjoy? 
Okay, fantastic. Where are you working? Oh, Barry, you want to get up? Okay, um, Jim Simak. Yeah. Right, Jim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. No, and that's excellent. So that's yeah. really good. And we're we're excited about it because we think the, the approach gives us the ability to take uh, kind of solid requirements, a little bit jelloy, and um, provide those those builds that people the users can use, beat up on, give us feedback, and still recover from their changes and tweaks in under budget and schedule, the plan budget yeah. schedule. So that's that's why we like it. So. With you saying, no, that's, that's a good point. So there's two ways to look at uh, Agile, and I think one is I like Agile because I can get my details very descript. Mm -hmm. I have a product owner who's going to write out big, huge user cases. Mm -hmm. There's no ambiguity. I know exactly what needs to be built. So hopefully you're not building anything that A, is not going to be used because there's business value on it, and B, you're, you're not going to wait two weeks building something that is wrong. So, but what you're using it for is also a, you know, a great use of Agile, and that's let's build some prototypes. Let's build this, let's see if it's useful, and if it's not, we only wasted two weeks, maybe four weeks building it, right. we can recover. We didn't waste six months. So that happened a lot of my past jobs before I did Agile. I would build stuff for six months, and then all of a sudden it was never used again, because someone in marketing thought it was a great idea for me to go build some crazy tool that they thought would help them that they never used. Well, so a classic waterfall, which yes. puts you into that trap all the time, and we're trying to get away from that. Break. Yep. So you, what you guys are using it for is actually very helpful and it's going to help you guys be more productive and less waste. Definitely. Now what I, what I what I'm encountering though is we're kind of having to take these classic waterfall design requirement documents and, and try to parse them into bite-sized iterations that can be done with so sprints. So that's kind of a challenge. It is a challenge, but once you do it and once you figure it out, it's going to be unbelievable. You, you got to figure that out. So you want to break down, you don't, so the user stories, you know about the Fibonacci, you do 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Mm -hmm. If you have a 13, that's too much. You need to break that down even more. So if you have these big complex use cases right now, they're probably all 21s and they probably could even be higher. You're mm -hmm. looking at these things and saying this is crazy. Right. Agile down. is not going to be helpful there. What Agile is going to help you do is look and say, this is too much, let's break it down to even more user stories. And yeah. what you should consider doing, one technique is the Gherkin technique, which is given when then. Given I'm a customer, when I uh, show up on this web page and I want to log in, then I should you know, get a validation error if I give the wrong information. So all the user stories are given when then. Okay. So that helps okay. you, everyone, business people, yeah. the uh, engineers, okay. the QA people, everyone can speak in that language, given when then. Okay. And all user stories can follow, fall right into that uh, quite nicely. Okay. All right, yeah, I, th I think I've noticed that in some of the uh, user stories. freeware out there that tracks There's a lot of given one then. Stories. Yeah. How about, do you ever, do you have any kind of experience with like a, because I have a, a geographically distributed team, a virtual whiteboard to, to you know, move yep. post it around. Have, have, do you have any experience? So we're using um, Jira right now, which has Greenhopper. Okay. So we have our testers all over in Kiev. So we lose them at noon. So we get in early and, you know, they're, they start at like three in the morning. So we have a distributed team, it's working. It was a challenge, we finally, finally got it to work. Yeah. So having Jira, having the Green Hopper, everyone's on page, we can all see each other's progress. We see what's you know, to do, we see what's in progress, we can read the comments all along and we see what's, you know, what's in done. Okay. So it's been working quite well. But it does take, a, it's very difficult doing distributed teams. We're the second person that's recommended Jira. We, we're kind of committed to our... What are you guys using? Uh, the Rational, we use IBM, uh, Rational Rose? Rose? Quest, uh, or case. We're actually using doors now for requirements tracking. Is it complicated or is it is it intuitive? Well, it's entrenched. <laughs> yeah, so there's no getting out of it. Yeah, you guys got to use it. No. It's been well adopted. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, it's a lot to deal with that, but I've, I've, uh, I've found some Excel spreadsheets. I'm going to try to tweak those. It must be said, oh, so there's a great site you need to go do. Boom. Oddly enough, you can go get a whiteboard. You can, or you can just get a big, you know, on the wall, take little post-its, and that works great too. As long as you have the work phases of to-do, in progress, ready to test, and done, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can go do it on a wall, yeah. and you have little post-its, and you can watch the progress and see things get done. And when something's not moving, that means there's a blocker there, right. and you guys are supposed to talk about it and say, why is this not moving? Because someone might be stuck and yep. just might not have voiced it, or, or they might be trying to solve it themselves when there's someone else that can help that person move, move the process along. Have you, have you had an integrator at the end look at whatever functionality you just coded from a systems level, or is it one, one person goes from cradle, 
design development, coding, coding unit tests, integration into systems level systems testing. So we're building web applications. So the web applications that we're building have unit tests, integration tests, and functional UI tests. They're all very different from each other. Mm -hmm. right. um, one of them does open up in an automated fashion a browser and clicks on you know buttons and make sure that there's certain status is there. So those are very fragile. They're tough because you know if someone moves the UI around, all of a sudden yeah, the tests right, are broken. Right, right. But the unit tests and integration tests are excellent because you know right away immediately if you broke something in the code. So what we have a definition of done. I don't know if you guys are doing definition of done, but that's also very important. You agree. You have a, you agree as a team. You say these are the things. This user story can't be done until all of these are met. And sometimes. Okay unit tests are part of that. Don't put code in to uh, you know, the subversion or whatever your version control is. Don't commit something unless you have a unit test behind it. So that way you always have 100% code coverage. So that's one of our definition of done. Yeah, we, 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 unit tests have to be written before the coding happens. Uh, that's excellent. Yeah, so that would be a, a requirement of getting something to done. But, but, but same person doing all those uh, phases of the life cycle? All the engineers, we have 10 of us. We take a user story and we own that user story. We develop it from beginning all the way to the end. Is that critical to you all, do you think, to your success? I kind of think I work, I'm going to need some subject matter experts that have some pretty. I'm very fortunate to be working with ten very experienced, talented engineers. Everyone has over ten years' experience. Everyone, okay. just, everyone's very talented. So I've worked also in past agile teams where we had junior developers. So sometimes they don't have the skill set to write unit tests. Sometimes they don't have the skill set to do code reviews or write documentation because you might need technical or functional. So someone else in the team would pick that up. So say if we had a user story here, and I'd say, all right, I'm going to do the implementation on this. Someone else might say, I'll do the unit test for that. And someone else, you know, maybe a technical writer, I'll write the documents. So that's normal too, very, very normal. I'm on a team right now where we're all so highly um, productive and so you know experienced that we can do everything for one story and get it all the way to done. But in the past, I've worked in a lot of teams where five people can be on one story, which is also excellent too, because that builds camaraderie and everyone now owns you know, a piece of yeah, every single right. story. So yeah, I kind of like that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn it that way. You mentioned code reviews. How, what kind of, how, how often do you review in the, in the cycle? Do you do a design review, a code review? No, des no design review, because a design review is really thought, it, it, it's, you have an architect, and the architect comes up, you know, he's supposed to be the brain, it's the smartest person. He comes up with the design of the system, then everyone just falls into that system. So that's, okay. that's right at the, the inception of the, of the project. But code reviews would be great all the time. A lot of people don't have time to do it. it it's, we probably lack that the most. I would love to have everything that went in code reviewed. We don't have time because we have deadlines. You know. So, if we, so what we're trying to do right now, we have the workflow of to do, ready to test, and done. Uh -huh. but we put a new phase in there, which is code review. So if something's in there yeah. and someone has a time, anyone can go open up that, go look at the source code, just take a quick look and see, you know, is there any smell tests? Is something wrong? Is something standing out? And don't spend too much time on it. And it's not a matter of calling someone else out. It's just you might see something that could be an issue with the code down the road. So yeah. it's almost just like an extra safety check. Okay. Anything but nothing at the end? Uh well, we do continuous system. integration, so every time we check something in, we know immediately if it, if it works or not. So there's no need to do integration tests or have someone fit it all in together. It either works immediately after you check it in or it doesn't. So we have all different levels. We have the local machine, we have a dev box, we have a QA box, we have a staging box, and we have production. Okay. We have five levels, okay. right. so nothing ever goes into production broken. Yeah. It never. It's 99% of the time it doesn't happen. I think we have three, one local, and then a, the, the mainstream, and then an installation stream yeah. for, for target platforms. Hmm. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, what do you, why do you, do your software engineers prefer Agile as a framework within to work, or do people long for the good old days of Waterfall, or? Everyone's different. So I will say where I'm working now, I'm fortunate that uh, everyone's looking at the greater good, and they know that Agile's the right thing to do, but the people who've been doing this for a long, long, long time yeah, yeah, yeah. don't like it. Right. They don't like it at all. Database guys hate it. Um, C++ guys hate it because they've been around forever, and it's just not normal. So a lot of the young guys in their 20s and 30s completely are on board. They love it. They get it, and they, they enjoy it. So it's the guys that have been around forever. Um, they're doing it. I know that they're not happy. They think it's a waste of time with all the meets, but they're important. They don't see it as important. They said, I'd rather be at my desk you know, writing code. So, some, so for them, something that, like most IT workers, something that lets them feel accomplishment every day or at least every other day could maybe start to overcome that feeling of being interrupted for yet another scrum. How about, um, do, you do, do you do any virtual scrum meetings? Do you have people phoned in or videoed in? Or A lot of people work from home. Um, so where I work now, the, um, everyone worked from home, all the engineers. So that was the beginning of the culture of the company. 
Now we moved to a bigger office, so there's tons of space. Yep. So people are coming in more, but a lot of people are still working from home. So everyone Skypes in constantly. We're on Skype all day long, everyone. But, you, but the video comp component so is We important. have Polycom too, so yeah, there's a lot of people. So the people over in Russia, and all in Kiev, they probably come in with us and we talk to them, we see them, they see us, we're all standing around a table and we do a daily stand up with them. Okay. So they probably come in and then if someone's working from home, if I'm working from home, I'll video in via Skype and talk to someone if we have to resolve something. Okay, yeah, we, we might consider using Skype too. Uh, that's been a lot, of, a lot of answers. I really appreciate it. Um, I can probably think of other, other things, but at, at the beginning of the process, it's nice to know that there are people that have doing this, been doing it for a while and they're getting successful with it. We're, our challenge is fitting it into a, a waterfall, a whole culture that's used to waterfall. Not just my engineers, but all. Like, Have you guys brought someone in to help uh, help transition that process? Because you really should bring an agile coach in that's done it, that's yeah. very experienced. So that way you don't. People might think they know what they're doing, and if you're doing it wrong, it's going to be counterproductive, and then everyone's going to have a bad taste in mouth. You yeah. really should consider bringing someone in that's done that's it, good advice. and they'll help transi transition, and they'll tell you why you're doing what you're doing. A lot of people don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. Right. That's the problem. That's good advice. We'll probably need to do that. All right. Well, Ron, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. No problem.